<laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was really excited to get these gentlemen to come onto this panel because this is one of my favorite topics. Um, if you watch my stuff, you'll know that I love talking about the legends, and that's what the Age of Heroes is really about. It's about a lot of legends. Um, now, we actually have a prequel in the works that is going to be surrounding the Age of Heroes. And so um, this is actually a topic that's going to be probably near and dear to a lot of people's hearts very, very soon. So I thought that this was going to be a really good topic to discuss today. Um, now, what do we know about the Age of Heroes? We don't really know a whole lot. It's actually pretty vague. There's a lot of very random um, legends coming out. Legend of Azora High, the last hero. We have the legend of Garth Greenhand, the Great King. All of these different things. And really, what does this mean and what really happened? It's said that um, in the description for the prequel, it says it's not the story that we think we know. So uh, it's putting a lot of questions in our head. And uh, today we're going to go ahead and talk about them. And one of the first things that we're going to talk about is the timeline. Um, if you've read the books, you will know that the timeline suggests that the long night occurred somewhere around um, 10 to 8,000 years ago, which is a very, very long time ago as far as the timeline goes from a Game of Thrones. Um, however, in an interview, George R. R. Martin has stated that um, it's possible that the timeline is actually closer to around 5,000 years, which is interesting because that actually puts us around the same time as Valyria beginning to rise. So that is going to put a lot of different implications because that is putting the rise of Valyria um, in around the very same time as the uh, Long Night. And when I talk about the Long Night and the Age of Heroes, um, there are two different periods of time. There are two different periods of time within um, uh, George R. R. Martin's historical timeline. Um, <laughs> there are two, and uh, so people like Tolkien, um, they um, divide things into the, like ages of men. So George R. R. Martin has kind of done the same thing. So you have the Long Night, the Dawn Age, you have the Age of Heroes. And um, it, it wasn't actually... Um, completely uh, determined where the Age of Heroes and where the Long Night kind of stood. However, in the description for the prequel, it said that um, it's going to start in the Golden Age of Heroes and then descend into the Long Night. So now we're getting a little bit of some confirmation on this timeline. So the Age of Heroes did actually occur prior to the Long Night, which is also going to have some implications. And so my question for you gentlemen is, is uh, what do you think with Valyria rising? Do you think that we're going to actually see um, the Valyrian Empire within this prequel? Within the, is it going to play a, a, anything it, into It depends the on how, how long they're willing to stretch out the timeline, because this is like over hundreds of years. I mean, because the Age of Heroes, we don't know exactly how long it lasted, but it was like about 2,000 years, right? And then what's the golden age? I mean, so is, is the golden age right at the end? Do you know what I mean? Because if they're going to go right into the long night, um, I, I don't know. It seems, do they have enough time to do that in a TV show? That seems like a large scale thing. I don't know. Yeah. Are, are they going to give us this in like, uh, in, in the sense of its mythology, right? And George made it mythology for a reason. So how many of these details and exact, um, you know, ideas of what actually happened during this time is going to be able to be, you know, displayed to us and, and still keep what makes the lore so great is something that I always think about. Because, I mean, he makes lore for a reason. Token makes it for a reason. You don't give too many details about it. It's kind of like our prehistory, in a sense. What do you think, Robert? Um, I, I think I, we should start with the disclaimer that we do not know the details of this because yeah. George R. R. Martin has been deliberately fuzzy on it. And that means that they have got a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the, the spin-off series, that it could go anywhere. I mean, I think in terms of, uh, just to pick up on your talking about with the iteration of the, uh, the Age of Heroes and the Long Night, my 
take on that is that the Long Night is within the Age of Heroes uh, mm -hmm. because it contains characters like Azora High and The Last Hero and all the rest of that. Um, and these are epochs, really, rather than specific periods of time. It's not like 9 a.m. on this day until you know, 2 p.m. on that mm -hmm. day a few thousand years later. There will be a lot of fuzziness about one end, when one age ends and another age begins. But in terms of Valyria, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that they will start focusing a lot more on Westeros, and Valyria obviously is a long, long way away, um, but that I hope that we will see uh, some hints of the rise of the dragons, because that is hugely important, not just to where they are, but to actually what's happening on Westeros. And we, we know or think we know that there was some contact, particularly in places like Old Town, uh, between the two continents. Exactly. And there are actually legends and hints of dragons being present um, many, many thousands of years ago in Westeros. Yeah. And Old Town is one of the best examples of it. Um, they have one of the few stone fortresses over there. We have um, legends such as Sirwin of the Mirror Shield, who slayed a dragon. We have legends such as da Davos the Dragon Slayer. Even the last hero, the, the hero that ended the long night, he did that <laughs> with a blade of dragon steel. So um, there's, there's lots of, and also mentions of roos, er, roosters. Roosters roosting on Battle, battle Isle. No, dragons um, roos, roosting on Battle Isle. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's a lot of hints that dragons may be a part of this long night um, legend, this long night battle, whatever had, had actually happened. Because there's um, hints throughout the entire storyline, even with the last hero, that suggest that you know, some sort of dragon presence. So, so yeah. there's that as well. And um, also, Azor Ahai itself is an Asosi legend. It's a legend from the East, and that's one of your favorite legends, um, with uh, Yintar and Yiti and locations with the Shai and everything. Uh, For sure. Absolutely. The thing about the Long Night, too, is that it wasn't really an age when you talk about, like, the Dawn Age and uh, the Age of Heroes. It's kind of like it lasted at most a generation. So it kind of just marks the end of the Age of Heroes, right? So... Yeah, I'm really tired, guys. I'm it's tired. an a, well, it's an event. It's an event that happens during this age, mm -hmm. it, and we do see the, you know uh, the fall of the Shadowlands, and we see Valeria's rise. So one thing leads to another. So we see this devastation come in the east, and we see the rise of another kingdom. And then we see the same thing happen with Valeria and Westeros, right? It's always escaping this doom, right? Yeah. To to have something better, and it's always kind of what they play off of. And you have your theory that there might be two separate. Uh, you know, it's not just the myth being interpreted by the East and West that Azora Ahai and the Last Hero could be separate people, which is an interesting concept. It seems like they combined a bunch of different historical figures and just um, said, "Oh, this is one person." Because like there's legends all over, not just in Westeros. I mean, there's even the five forts in the east where they, what were they trying to keep out? And the story is strikingly similar to the story of the Long Night in Westeros. It's like um, uh, you have the Bloodstone Emperor who uh, kills his sister, the Amethyst Empress. And then for that, the, light, the Maiden of Light turns her back on the world and the Lion of Night comes in and he unleashes his minions onto the world of men, whatever that means. And so they've got that frozen desert in the five forts to protect against that. Like in the north of Westeros, we have the wall and stuff. So it's similar in that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as far as the prequel goes, do you have any predictions as far as what do you think we might see? I would like to see Bran the Builder be depicted as a regular mason, you know, because it's a legend. It's a story about this mythical figure, this hero that we hear about, and we see, we humanize him. You start off maybe with an old man type, discussing who this man is in, you know, the more recent timeline. You go back to a skinny guy that's, you know, getting bullied by his foreman, you know, putting up some masonry work. And you see the rise of Brand the Builder, because that's what it's about. You know, are these, are these stories, you know, created to, you know, actually depict what the culture was or after the fact to make it what 
you know, the anvils and so forth and the seven want it to be. So yeah, I think that they're going to show us uh, a, a few key figures like Brand the Builder and, and Garth the Green Hand. And I think that that's really the interesting aspect as well as the others to see if it's the same situation in the East as it is in the West. Because mm-hmm. like you said, it's basically the same thing with the defenses, everything, forts, natural defenses mixed with magic. The thing I wonder about Brand the Builder is like a lot of the things he's like, they attribute to him, like were built like, many many years apart so it's like seems almost certain that he didn't do all of them right so that's why i feel like they combined different legends and it kind of became one person over time well the the style of building constru- construction is quite different for a lot of these structures so it does make you wonder because storm sun has a very 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 specific type of building construction and um, it's talked about how the stones are placed so intricately together that you can't uh, fit anything in between any of the stones. It's, um, you know, very, very high quality. And it's, a, and it's actually built in a, like, a basically a, like a round type of a tower. Um, the high tower is much different. And, and we probably don't actually get to see the actual original high tower that Brand the Builder had built because we've, it's grown in construction um, over the years. Then you have Winterfell, which is also quite different. So, um, and of course the wall yeah. is obviously the, the biggest thing that um, is much, you know, very extremely unique in building construction. So you have a lot of different building styles. So um, I'd be interested to see if this is all the same person, um, the evolution of how he would have actually, you know, how he would have gone from one place to the other to build these things. Um, George R. R. Martin has said in an interview that um, he uh, he likes to think of, of uh, the legend of Brand the Builder as um, this uh, this guy that they just like to attribute things to. So when they see this amazing structure, they like to say, "Oh, Brand the Builder built it," you know. But um, but yeah, I'd like to know you know how he got that name, which structures he actually did build, um, and how they were built. The wall specifically, but also Storm's End, because you see a lot of um, mystical things associated with Storm's End, because you have the ward that Melisandre cannot get through. This magical ward, and it's very similar to the wall, which also has a ward. So you do see a similarity there with those two things. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, what do you think, Robert? Um, I, I think I'm I'm most looking forward to the. Uh, I mean, we're sort of touching on already, but the, the the way the world is going to look and feel different. We've got very used to, within the kind of Game of Thrones world of of where the important things are. The important things are King's Landing. The important things are Winterfell and the Wall. And those things are not going to be necessarily the important things in this story. King's Landing won't be there at all. Winterfell, um, if it has been built, is not a castle so much as like a small tower above a huge vault. Um, the the centre of things will probably be Old Town. That is the cultural centre. That is the most populous place. That is the, the biggest port with the link across to Essos. So what I think we're going to see is a big shift away from uh, this kind of like Winterfell King's Landing axis that we've had all this time and to um, Old Town. And what I'm hoping is that we get more of the children of the forest. Yeah. Because the whole point about uh, uh, the Age of the Heroes is that the Age of Heroes followed the pact between the first men and the children of the forest. Um, and this was when they were working together and they were giving uh, a sort of obsidian blades to the Night's Watch on a regular basis and all the rest of it. So there was a, not just a belief in them, but there was actual regular contact with the children of the forest. So I'm expecting a lot more of that uh, and a lot more caves. If we're going to see Casterly Rock, they didn't show it, (laughs) but that is caves. So I think that it's going to be a lot more underground, and I'm sorry to say, after last season, probably quite dark for a lot of (laughs) people. Since since you just brought up uh, the children of the forest, what I think is interesting, we see in the show that they created the White Walkers. And when Bran says, why did you do this? She says... We were at war, but the Age of Heroes was after the pack. It was during a time of peace. So it'll be really interesting to see what triggered that, right? Did something happen? With the, they upset the children of the forest in some way? So they snapped and created the greatest threat that ever existed. 
well, how accident. can we trust the children of the forest? You know, of course not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and there is also a, um, a possibly a children of the forest presence not only in um, Westeros but also in Essos in the ancient past. It's described in the World Book that there was this uh, race of small, shy, diminutive forest folk. And uh, when Corlys Valerian traveled to where their old haunts were, he talked of carved trees, which. Um, should make you very, very suspicious. So it's possible that if we do see Essos in, um, in the prequel, we may also see Children of the Forest in Essos as well, which is going to be incredibly interesting to, to see that. And the Children of the Forest in Essos were actually completely, as far as we know, completely vanquished. So, um, you know, maybe it's possible that um, part of that pact was not just for Westeros, but um, on a more grand scale. Um, so that's, that might be something to look out for as well. But speaking of Old Town, um, setting. As far as the, um, the Age of Heroes and the Long Night goes, um, what places do you think we'll be seeing? Well, Old Town, definitely. I'm wondering about Yi T, but that might be wishful thinking, the Great Empire of the Dawn. I would love to see some ancient, like, kind of Chinese-looking architecture and clothes, too. Yeah, Old Town is going to be your hub for Westeros. And then you have your Summer Isles where you, where you can have your connection because of the trade and get over to the east. Because they do say in the log line, the mysteries of the east. Yeah, they do. So, you know, I, I really think that we're going to see the, the Shadowlands. And as long as they preface it with this is what was before Valeria for the casual fan, high concept. This is meant to make a lot of money. They're counting on this making a lot of money, and this is going to have a lot of what we know, like Keen's Landing, like Robert just said, pretty much non-existent. Old Town, uh, if you're just a show watcher, you really just envision what? The, the, the Citadel? You don't have a real good idea, so they have to sell us on these locations that are going to be the focuses without really the recognition that you know, probably all of you guys have, but we're talking the 30 people that you, you know, convinced to watch the show, everybody that you've ever met in a grocery store, you know, and told them to watch the show. You know, you have to sell it, um, but they, you have to trust that the fans will accept a new story, not just a complete rehash, you know. I think that's important. And I think just to build on that, this is new. And the world that we're working with here is the, the world of uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of petty kingdoms. So it's not that there are the seven, eight massive houses that you've heard of. Some of them don't even exist yet. There are lots and lots and lots of smaller locations dotted about all over the place. So I think that, yes, I agree, we will see all the places that we've been talking about, but I think a lot of the focus will be on places we've never even heard of that probably don't exist in the current time of Game of Thrones. Like, like the ring forts. There are, there are several abandoned ring forts within the series. Um, one of them is actually the Fist of the First Men, where you see this um, incredible battle behind the wall or beyond the wall with uh, the Night's Watch and um, the others. And, um, and, and they talk about it being a you know a very old, very mysterious place. Um, and so places right, like ring forts uh, that were uh, establishments of the uh, first men may also come into play. So they also have ring forts on Sea Dragon Point and also, was it over by White Harbor? I'm not sure, I actually. I think there's one over in, on an island by White Harbor, possibly. But, uh, but ring forts is also something that you may be actually seeing as well. So you may see the, um, the first men having you know small you know, establishments like ring forts and um, larger places such as Old Town. I, I'm pretty sure that we'll probably see places like that are incredibly old, possibly the building of Storm's End. Um, also, the Iron Islands, there's a lot of um, ancient mysteries involved with there. So we may see the Iron Islands actually come into play as well. There's talk about the um, a sea stone chair that um, was just there, and they, they had found it, and um, it was on the shores, and you know they they made that their throne. But um, and there's also uh, the tale of um, Pike. They don't know who built Pike. Um, it's you know it's it's a very old and ancient place. So it's possible that the Iron Islands may also be a location that we see. Well, 
Uh, it's mentioned like really briefly in the book in one of old Nan's stories. I don't know how accurate it is that the children of the forest might have had secret cities hidden away somewhere. So I'd really like to see that like a city hidden away in the woods full of children of the forest. Yes. And, you know, um, and they, they, uh, they, they said secret cities in hollow hills. Yeah. And there's also mention of tree towns. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the books. The people we, in the trees. Yeah. The yeah. lady of the leaves. Mm-hmm. Yes. They, in the books, they actually um, show you a little tree town that that um, actual people had built and um, Arya and the Brotherhood go and, and visit there and I think that that's kind of a nod to the children of the forest mm-hmm. so we may see these um, secret cities hollow hills and, and even tree towns as well That'd and in, be really the, cool. in the pact which started the age of heroes uh, one of the terms of the agreement so to speak was that the children of the forest were given the deep forests so those bits were areas that were controlled by them, and that is probably where we would expect to see these kinds of things. And that, so that although there's a, a friendship and a kinship between humans and children of the forest, they are still separate physically. It's just that there is contact between them. Yeah. And one of the things that I've always found interesting is that the, the only culture that seems to still follow this, um, this kind of pact is the Dothraki. Um, it's mentioned, and uh, it, it's mentioned that um, uh, the Dothraki they um, may, may have actually feared the children of the forest. Um, if they they're not sure if they um, because they only stay to the plains. And the rationale that they provide in the World Book is that they it's possible that they did that out of fear or reverence for the Epicuevron, which is that uh, small, shy, diminutive forest folk. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting that the only culture that actually seems to call, kind of follow that is a culture that may have rever- reverence for yeah. um, the children of the forest. Yeah, because so. it's like they were supposed to get the deep woods, but then they totally didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's no consistency. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of reinforce. Like, that's the standard then. But then you have these structures that are built with this, you know, technology or, you know, methods that are from the East. It doesn't make sense. The same with the children of the forest over in the East. So you have all these conflicting structures. It's not like uniform. Like, once they start building, like, how they built the, you know, high tower, you don't see that across the board. You still just see reinforce around it. So there's just certain locations that have this advanced technology. In if you think they learned that skill, they would apply it to everything, but they didn't. So and that kind of plays into our history as well. We don't really know how to explain a lot of things that we built and where did it come from? Why didn't it become the norm? I mean, you know, when we build buildings, we get a better way to do it. We usually try to do that universally. Uh, so what is the reasoning for this? You know. So one of the things that I think is probably the biggest reason for this um, this shift is probably the introduction of another culture. Um, it's said that the first men, you know, worked bronze. Um, you know, they they only built square towers. They did not build round ones. Um, there's there's a lot of um, different things that the first men actually. Um, we're said to do, and that, that, like you said, is kind of conflicting with some of the things that we actually see. And it's quite possible that what we are seeing is just um, the the emergence of a new um, people or a new culture into Westeros. And that may play into Old Town, where it said that seafarers and traders from uh, Valeria and the Summer Isles may have um, actually used Old Town as a port. So. They have interests there, so their technology is being utilized, you know, because that's something they're invested in. So maybe that's why it's not across the board. Yeah, I mean, this this does kind of tie in this this kind of technological disparity that we see in these sort of ancient buildings, where they seem to be living in caves and with hill forts and all the rest of it, but then at the same time having fused stone and amazing architecture in Storm's End. There's a huge difference in technology going on there, and. Um, so that ties in with the idea that there somewhere is someone who's advanced, but they're not based in Westeros. So perhaps the trade route is bringing this technology in to Old Town from Essos. And so perhaps we might not initially see Essos, we will just feel the influence of Essos. Absolutely. And so um, I'm a big fan a lot of a lot of the different um, he- legends of heroes. What are, who are some heroes that you think that we'll see? I know that it's mentioned that we will see some Starks and possibly um, 
some Lannisters, not at first. Yeah, I'm thinking Lan the Clever. I don't know if that's technically a hero. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is to the Lannister. I admire his qualities. Because, okay, it says um, there's no Lannisters at first. There's the Casterlies. The Casterlies are at, um, are at Casterly Rock. So it would be cool. I think someone mentioned this in another panel that I was in. It would be cool to see like Lan the Clever kind of steal Casterly Rock from the... <laughs> from yeah, the cast release. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. a hoodwink. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I would love to see Land, because Land the Clever has the craziest um, founding stories like of everybody. It said that um, he swindled Casterly Rock away from the Casterlies by doing some really crazy stuff like using butter to um, like slide in between the um, cracks in Casterly Rock to have his way with the Casterly's daughters. It's all classy and, stuff. It's classy cla- stuff. It's classy. a good story. He's a classy guy. Yeah. Um, so you're gonna. You, we might get to see that level of classiness with Lion the Clever. But um, it's also said that he had tricked Garth Greenhand um, into um, giving him his inheritance. That uh, he, he tricked him into. Um, saying that he was somebody that he wasn't and getting that inheritance. And it said that he stole gold from the sun to to make his hair gold. And um, so I got a question for you guys. How do you convince Garth Greenhand to that you're, you're one of his sons? How do you do that? How many partners does he have? <laughs> I mean, so the, well, he he was a pretty lusty yeah, guy, so yeah. you know he, he spread his seed. It might around. be pretty easy. Well, yeah, as long as the East hasn't brought over DNA, then I, I think I could pull it off. I, I'm imagining some sort of equivalent to the Jacob and Esau kind of story of like an old Garth Green hand and being blind, and then somebody being brought into him rather than some clever wheeze that makes you go, oh, "Wow, you seem really similar to me." Why is that? That's that that doesn't work for me. Yeah, in fact, there's actually um, uh, a guy named, um, he he goes by Blue Blood on Twitter, but um, he has a a page, a WordPress called um, A Song of Ice and Fire Unchained, and um, he actually uh, was talking about how Land the Clever may also be part of the Azor Ahai monomyth. And what you're going to find with a lot of these legends, when you start to look at them, is a lot of them are... um, possibly all just one huge monomyth of this one hero. And, um, and he does a good job of suggesting that Land the Clever might also be one of them. And it's interesting because it said that Huzor Amai, um, another legend in the East, um, wore the pelt of the king of the hairy men. And uh, that's exactly what um, uh, Jacob did in order to get um, Esau's inheritance. He had um, put on some sheepskin because his brother was very, very hairy. And that's how he swindled the inheritance, was he put on the pelt of, of the king of the hairy men, basically. So that may actually be a hint. And one of the things uh, that I think might happen with swindling something from Garth Greenhand, it said that his... Um, Green, uh, Garth Greenhand had green hair and green skin. It was green all, all over. Um, and it's also said that an interesting story about Land the Clever, about how um, Land the Clever stole gold to make his hair gold. So you see a change, possibly a change in hair color. And I don't, I've got some tin foil that the way that he did it is he had to dye his hair green. But, uh, <laughs> well, Lannister's an a- Andal surname, right? And it comes from the female side, George has stated. So that's also very interesting because, you know, it, it, are we going to see somebody before Land the Clever, Land the Clever's mother and so forth? Um, because it's going to be the cast leaves at first, obviously. I, I say obviously because George said that, so let's hope it sticks to it. But, uh, you know, um, but yeah, I think that it, it's very interesting. Garth the Greenhand, that, that's, that seems a lot harder to pull. I'll be interested to see that. But yeah, all these are usually combinations of, of stories that, you know, it, it speaks to a deeper truth. It might not have fact, but it's truth, right? And it, it embodies the culture. So, and also, this was written by the Andals. So this is a, you know, these, they have an agenda themselves. So it'd be very interesting how they depict this, you know, if we're going to get fact, because that's the log line, literally. You think you know what happened. I'm like, yeah, we watched the show. I thought I knew what happened. They're like, you don't. They're like, and we're going to tell you how. And they're using the... I can't think of a more vague time, and I love it. It's a sandbox. They can do whatever they want, but they also have to count on, like I said, um, having people 
get past there's not you know king's landing there's not everything they know from the show and we're talking about just casual viewers um and you want to learn about these new characters um but it'll be interesting if they leave it up to be you know like a matter of fact or subjective because i don't want it to become a matter of fact i don't think that's what it is Absolutely. well a little bit i want a little bit of little fact bit? Okay. i want another one that says you still think you th no yeah there you go still don't i'm like oh god Next time we'll get it. Cool. Yeah, oh, God. it's a good business yeah. model. <laughs> yeah, um, one of the things I, I like to see, uh, my, my favorite legend is, of course, the legend of the Great King. Um, and I, I th do think that we're going to see the Iron Islands. And um, it's a, another crazy legend where it said that he was gray all over and um, he helped establish the seafaring culture of the Ironborn. I'd love to see that legend um, particularly. There's all kinds of legends. Duran God's Grief, for instance, um, the progenitor of House Baratheon. Are we going to see the progenitor of um, all the houses? Are we going to see, um, you know, uh, obviously, are we going to see the first Martell? Are we going to... Um, see maybe some other Dornish, such as the first Dane of Starfall. Um, are there any particular legends you're wanting to see, Robert? Um, well, all of them. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that, for me, I'm pretty sure that if Lan the Clever is in this, then they will be my favorite character. I'm, I'm almost convinced of that already. Um, but I think that the bit that I'm most looking forward to, if George R. R. Martin has been lobbying whatever they might call it, Blood Moon on set, but George R. R. Martin has constantly been lobbying for this to be called The Long Night. Uh, and that means that because he's been intimately involved in the creation of this, that means that we are going to see The Long Night, and that means that we are going to see uh, something, whether it's Azora High or The Last Hero or something, but we're going to see old man's stories and how true they are. And that, for me, is the, the bit that I'm most excited about. The things that impact on the story we've got now that are just legends and we've been told you shouldn't, you shouldn't take them too seriously, we're actually going to either see them or they've happened in living memory. So, Amanda, you brought up the Great King. So do you think we're going to see Naga, the sea creature, while she was still alive? <laughs> that would be really cool. I, I, yeah, I don't. I I, uh, I have a theory video if you guys want to check it out. Um, but there's there's actually a few theories um, throughout the fandom um, as far as what Naga was. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, it said that the Great King um, ruled the sea itself and took a mermaid to wife, and he slew the sea dragon Naga. Mm -hmm. um, so and uh, when you actually go to the Iron Islands, there's these these uh, monument of the great king's bone that stand testament to the, the great king's feats. And uh, there's actually theories that Naga isn't what people believe it She's is. She's a weirwood. Yes. Yeah, I've heard yes. the weirwood theory. Yes, there's actually, um, there's a couple theories that it, it was a weirwood grove or that it's a weirwood boat. And um, when you actually look at the evidence at hand, um, it's possible that Naga is more than what it appears. So um, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think that we're going to see this uh, Great King slaying um, mm -hmm. a sea dragon. It would be really cool, though. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really cool. It would be really cool. Um, but I, and it said that he um, did a lot of great things, like um, taunting the storm god, lashed out with a thunderbolt, causing a tree to burn. Um, I'd like to see what uh, that legend is, is actually specifically referring to. But... Um, yeah, I I would like to see sea dragons. I think that'd be great. I just don't think that's going to be the case. I oh think man, that, I'm so disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. George R. R. Martin he likes to use um, something called uh, euhemerism, and basically euhemerism is uh, the historical theory of mythology, where it states that um, that uh, the legends are actually based on historical fact. They're not all completely made up. It's just that over the years and over, you know, through the telling, things have just been exaggerated and become more um, vague. And so what you have to do is you have to take a look at the legends themselves and, and ask yourselves, is this really what happened? And what hints to the legend can inform you about what might have actually happened? So um, I think that the Great King slaying Naga is is um, not what it actually appears mm -hmm. to be. See, another thing you thought you knew. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's not the story you think yeah. you know. It's not done. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, 
Yeah, uh, one of the things that I want to see particularly is going to be the first stain of Starfall. Mm -hmm. um, it said that the first stain of Starfall uh, had uh, traced a, a comet or a meteor uh, that had landed and had forged his sword, Dawn, um, from the heart of a meteor. And Dawn is actually shown within the books, not so much the the, the TV it's show. It's not in the show. Yeah, um, but it's a the, it's this really mysterious, amazing sword, and um, and it seems like this sword um, it was probably possibly somehow very important. It's, at, at it's one steel point. as yeah. well, which mm -hmm. they're not. You know, they're in the Bronze Age, exactly. and it's missing so, now. Yeah, exactly. so no one it, knows where it is. It's half you know from outer space and half a technology again that they don't. Yes. technically have so yes and the qualities of it are very very similar to valyrian steel as well so it it seems like there's a hint that there's possibly some sort of early valyrian technology that um was uh was there at the time because the qualities are are um insane it said that it it keeps its edge it's incredibly light um there's a lot of different a lot of parallels it, it's interesting that it's like uh, white and kind of translucent okay it's like a diamond while valyrian steel is like very dark and yes uh, yeah you know. and it says that valyrian steel drinks the light yeah uh while while uh dawn actually glows mm -hmm. so you see that inverse parallel as well there too so uh, i'd like to see that that sword being forged and how oh that, yeah that'd that be really cool down. well dorn's interesting too because it's not the dorn that we know again another thing i'm sorry to say but because it, it it's not yet merged you know you don't have the roinar you don't have that that mix you know that those events haven't happened yet so it's not r really representative of what we see which is a good thing in my opinion i'd like to see it to see what it was before well if you're just a show watcher, I guess what they depicted it as. Um, but you know what I mean? It, it's, it's, it's vastly different. Um, and that's very interesting. And as far as Dawn, too, doesn't Jamie make a comment about um, Arthur just touching his shoulder with it and it cuts right through with how sharp mm -hmm. it is? So it's, it's yeah. Really sharp. Yeah, it's always, it's always, you know, that there's that grounded sense of George's work and you think that, oh, this can be explained away and it's not real magic and then the dragon pops up. Or something you know magical so you never know you know how crazy you can get and that's what's fun about it yeah i mean and, and to sort of bring this back to the overall feel of what the spin-off series, series is going to be like as we started game of thrones it was very low fantasy there wasn't any real magic around there the characters were told to think of as clever like Tyrion scoffed at lots of things that were magical and actually real here there are some very clearly magical things that are going to be around uh, like the children of the forest um, and so uh, i think it's going to be uh, a lot more magic realism in the sense that there will be real magic at play but it will be just a part of life rather yeah. than a, an extra special thing there i just want to say there has to be because in in game of thrones this is at a time where magic has been fading for a really long time so in the age of heroes you have to assume there'll be more yeah. Absolutely. And do you think now we know that the long night, um, it, it's quite possible that um, obviously it says that the children, men were at war. Do you think that there were some men that were aligned with the children at one time? For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, because what we see Don't... is it talks about the uh, hammer of the waters. Um, there's two locations where the hammer of the waters is said to have, have occurred or the, where the children had called down the hammer of the waters. One of them is the God's eye. The other location is actually Moat Kalin. And um, Moat Kalin, it said that the um, the hammer had been called down by, uh, uh, at the, ch the location of the children's tower of Moat Kalin. Mm -hmm. And um, if you take a look at Moat Kalin, it, it is definitely not a secret city or a tree town or a hollow hill. It, its building construction is a building construction of men. So it's quite possible that even at the time of the Hammer of the Waters, that the children may have been aligned with at least some of the first men, even during that period. So that's um, something very interesting, is that you may actually see uh, first men aligned with the children. And um, now we have about 10 minutes left. I wanted to open it up for questions. Could I just, what about the children all being in line? 
Now, that's a good question. You know, I mean, there's no guarantee of that I either. I think there's dissent among them, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, dissent happens quite often, so yeah. I do, too. Yeah. I, I think there's like a revolutionary branch of children that created the White Walkers. Yes. yes. Yeah, he has a very good theory about yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm really fascinated by the Great Empire of the Dawn, which mm-hmm. mostly I know from all your guys' content. Um, I'm curious if you think that we will see the Bloodstone Emperor and the Amethyst Empress and all of that. And then the second part to that, which part of the Empire of the Dawn do you think became the aliens? I, I'll, I'll give to you after this, but I think if you, anybody, the abstract, when looking at this list, that the Bloodstone Emperor is who I'd put money on scene, and then I'll pass it along to the more lore savvy. Honestly, I don't know. There's not enough details about what went on in the Great Empire of the Dawn. There's, it's very sparse. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's possible the Bloodstone Emperor, it's possible it could be part of this bottom. Oh, yeah. I think we might see him, so, maybe. So um, I don't know if we're going to see the Great Empire because George R. R. Martin has specifically um, talked about uh, the Valyria just beginning to rise. Mm-hmm. And it, from what we know, there's a good possibility that Valyria actually branched off from the Great Empire. So, um, so what they'll, I'm not really sure how they're going to kind of like mash up that in the t- in the storyline. But if um, if the Bloodstone Emperor is part of the monomyth, then um, we'll probably see some sort of reference or some sort of um, inspiration from that legend. Uh, but it's really hard to tell because George R. R. Martin has said, you know, 5,000 years possibly is going to be the time of this, you know, the timeline that we're looking at and also Valeria rising. So, um, so that it's going to be interesting to see. I do think that it's a good possibility that the Bloodstone Emperor is part of that monomyth. So if you don't know about the Bloodstone Emperor, basically in, in the East, he's one of the legends that say he caused the long night but by killing his sister and taking her place. Yeah. Those I, threads connect it. I, I think the only thing I'd add to that, I'd completely echo what Quinn was saying there and also in the, um, the fact that we don't have huge amounts of information. But the one thing I would emphasize is the fact that that is thousands of miles away from where we think the action is going to be. So we we got used to, in the last few seasons of Game of Thrones, travel didn't happen. People just magically appeared in different <laughs> places. But thousands of miles at that time would have taken months, if not years, to move across. So I, we're not just going to see people popping to and fro, I think, I think, between the two areas. If the Bloodstone Emperor appears, it'll be on a long voyage, having got there for a reason. Um, our gentleman over here with the... Uh... Um, the names of say the long ago of the seasons would be regular. Do you think in the age of heroes that the seasons would be normal and we'll see what possible? Probably. I think it had something to do with the long night, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, George R. R. Martin has said in an interview that the um, rationale behind uh, the seasons being out of whack um, had a fantasy explanation, so a magical explanation. So um, it, I think that it's very possible that we may see um, the seasons being more regulated. And it's also possible that we may see, uh, because in the series, when the Night King was actually um, created, it's showing that area as being a nice, fertile, warm, you know, lush place. And uh, now that area is beyond the wall, and it's like the land of always winter. So we may also see some, some uh, differences there as well as far as um, the climate of locations. My tinfoil theory on that is that the long night was the thing that put everything out of whack because that brought winter across everywhere for so long that the, a, a magical winter, not just a, a normal winter, that the magic just sort of, kind of stayed, stayed in the earth in a way and that is, to, is just taking a long time for it to kind of get back to normal. And in Yi Ti, the legends say that after that happened, the world was a broken place. Yeah. It, it says that in the World of Ice and Fire. Absolutely. Gentleman in the back with the blue shirt. Uh, <clears throat> Yellow Marilla, excited maybe to see a house mud and old stones in its splendor. I was wondering if y'all, any extinct houses you think we might see? Oh, yes. Uh, I, 
I, I'm just going to go high concept and say I, I wouldn't guess they're going to get too niche. Not saying I don't want to see it, but what I would predict they're going to do. Um, I, yeah, that'd be interesting, but yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put money on it. What I would like to see is House Blackwood. Um, and it's not an extinct house, but um, it's a house that was uh, supposedly a northern house who uh, eventually um, were, I guess, defeated by the Starks and had to move and um, down to the Riverlands. And that's where they, they are now. House Blackwood is a very, very mysterious and magical um, house. And it's very interesting that they are a northern house that worship the old gods. So if there's any house that I want to see, it's going to be House Blackwood. But there's also a lot of other northern houses like House Greenwood and House uh, Frost from the north that I'd like to see um, as well. Um, uh, you mentioned Ashai a lot on your channel. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do you want to see happening in Ashai during the long day? I don't know if they're going to show us a shy. Do you think they're going to show us a shy? I see. I'm so surprised that's your view. I think I think everybody's focusing on Valeria when it's going to be a shy. Yeah, I just think it doesn't make. I think the rise of Valeria is implying that that's where they're going after this. That that that. Well, I would love to like maybe get some understanding as to who built the city and why, because it seems like a place that was specifically designed. It was built there for a reason, next to the heart of darkness and the mountains of the morn. So I, I feel like it's probably like one of the, it's a power point in the world, like in the north. Uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So there's a specific reason that they built it there. And it's a magic city where no magic is forbidden. So I, I, it's super cool. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we will see a shy. Um, it's shown in the world map. Uh, it's It actually was probably once mm -hmm. part of a fer fertile and forested uh, crescent. And the whole area of the Shadowlands is now just um, completely devoid of, of um, a lot of, uh, you know, of the fertility and life and vigor. It's, it's very dark, very mysterious. Um, so I, I believe that the events that happened during the long night are probably what caused that. Mm. So if we are going to see the long night, we're probably, I'd at least like to see a shy. Um, I, I think that it might happen. It said that um, the long night actually happened in Esos as well. Um, it's all over the, the world. world. It happened in, all over the world. So <laughs> if uh, we're, it, I'd, I'd at least hope that we see that because I think that that would be great. It's the largest landmass too. Yeah. Right. That now, we know of. Yeah, yeah. we know of. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's important to note, like you mentioned, it's, you know, like recorded in the maps at the Summer Isles, another example of how they're really going to be looking to tell a new story from everything I've seen is the Summer Isles weren't even on the official HBO maps. You know, again, like it's not a huge deal, but it's showcasing that they're injecting areas that they can play with. You know, there's not a lot of information other than it's a utopia, you know, that it's vastly different. And there's not a whole lot of butter butterflies. Yes. But, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of solid information. And it seems like, I mean, come on, this was already a skewed timeline last six months. George has skewed it even more in the blog, which is fine. But they obviously want to have a sandbox experience and be able to do what they want to do. They don't want to be held to any, uh, you know, constraints from from the lore, which again is still myth, so it's kind of odd. <laughs> it's not solid, as it is. Any other questions, gentlemen in the red shirt? I, I think law, yes. I think that's tied uh, very much into Azora High as a concept, and I think that probably will have come out of the Long yeah. Night, personally. So I think we will see that. Faith of the Seven, no. I don't think I don't think we will. Yeah. Um, but there are a huge amount of other religions that we don't see much of on the show, like the the Roynish religions with the Water God and all the rest of it. That kind of thing. I'm hoping we might see some of, yeah. One thing that I think that we're going to see as far as institutions go is going to be the institution of the Maesters. So Old Town is obviously going to be one of the locations that they're probably going to show. And um, it said that the uh, Citadel is actually an institution of the first men. So if we're going to see any institution, it would be, um, it would be the, probably the Maesters. So, um, we are actually out of time. We are out of yeah. time.
Yep. So, thank you. Thank you guys for coming.